Colleen matters. Colleen's life matters. Colleen is not a victim, body, or the deceased, as she has been described throughout this trial. She is not the slain or murdered Danvers High School teacher, as always portrayed in the media. Colleen was a caring and loving young woman, full of life, and a beloved teacher. We are here today because you have the profound responsibility of determining the sentence of Colleen's killer, whose name does not deserve to be spoken, not only for her murder, but also for the rape and the armed robbery, three very separate, deliberate crimes. Your decision is limited under the new so-called juvenile sentencing rules. Yours is a significant responsibility. First and foremost to Colleen, then to her family and friends, the Danvers High School community, and all those deeply affected by the loss of Colleen. You also have the responsibility of setting a precedent for these new sentencing laws, though we hope that no family is forced to endure the agony we have endured since October of 2013. Our family appeals to you to set a precedent that sends a clear message to criminals and respects the memory of our loved ones. Today, following years of proceedings and the trial, we finally turn our focus to Colleen. As you consider a sentence, I want to share with you who Colleen is, what our lives, those of us who love her and will continue, who loved her and are and will continue to be without her, and remember how how much she suffered in the brutality of the attack. Colleen is a person, a loving daughter, sister, granddaughter, niece, cousin, friend, and teacher. Colleen's life mattered to so many people. I want to share with you who Colleen is and will always be to me. Colleen is my daughter, my firstborn child, the oldest of my three children. I wish for nothing more in life than to be a mother. And on Saturday, May 13, 1989, the day before Mother's Day, Colleen was born and made me a mother. I always told her that she was the best Mother's Day present that I ever received. Colleen helped teach me how to be a mother. Colleen was your typical oldest child in many ways. She lived by a routine and was an overachiever. She was a happy and easygoing little girl. She was kind, loving, and motherly at an early age. Colleen loved when she became a big cousin to her cousin baby Jackie, who over the years was more like her sister. At three and a half, she became a big sister to her brother, Dan, and several years later to her baby sister, Lara. She loved being a big sister more than anything else. Because I worked, Colleen spent many hours caring for Dan and Laura over the years. Colleen helped make them into the strong and caring young adults you saw today. I see so much of Colleen in each of them. Colleen was a good, kind, and caring person. She was someone who stepped in and stepped up in time of tragedy or sadness. She did not shy away from it. She wanted to help make people feel better. She wanted to bring happiness to people during difficult times. Colleen worked tirelessly. She strived academically to do well so that she could achieve her goal of becoming a math teacher. She worked hard to get good grades, graduating from Andover High School in 2007 and magna cum laude from Assumption College in 2011. She quickly realized her dream of becoming a teacher when she began teaching in fall 2011 at Hill Middle School in Stowe. Colleen began teaching at Danvers High School in fall of 2012. Colleen carefully chose the schools to which she would apply, her own safety being a primary concern. She believed Danvers to be a safe place to teach and where she could share her love of math. She was very happy teaching there. Colleen was very passionate about what she taught. She looked for creative ways to help her students understand difficult concepts and to enjoy math. She made her students want to learn. In her first year at Danvers High, Colleen did not have a classroom. Instead, she shared one, moving to different classrooms throughout the day. In the fall of 2013, a year after she started at Danvers, Colleen was assigned her own classroom. She was so excited in setting up and getting ready for her students. I never had the opportunity to see Colleen teach something I wish I had loved, would have loved to have seen. Our family, though, has been fortunate to learn what Colleen was like as a teacher from the many letters, notes, and cards we received from her students. The following is an excerpt from a note from a student which summarizes the many messages we received to help you understand the teacher that the students lost that day her current and former students, and the students she had yet to have. A ray of sunshine is defined as a brightness or radiance, cheerfulness or happiness. 
When you think of a ray of sunshine, you think of positivity, light, or joy. The best way I can describe my junior year algebra teacher is by saying that she was simply a ray of sunshine. Ms. Ritzer amazed me from the get-go, and I knew that this was someone I would aspire to emulate. She stood out, and I always, and always went the extra mile to do what she needed in order to help her students succeed. I remember walking into her classroom every day and seeing nothing but a smile on her face and such eagerness to teach. It was evident that she was passionate about her work and did not take very long for me to realize that I was in the presence of someone special. She was someone I could confide, confide in when something was wrong, and as the year went on, I found myself looking forward to math class. I knew that in Ms. Ritz's class, I was guaranteed at least 55 minutes a day of pure positivity. I cherished that gift because I knew it was something extraordinary. This is the teacher that he took away. The simple things in life make Colleen happy. She looked for the good in every day. In the summer of 2013, Colleen began to keeping this jar, for at the end of the day, she would write down on a small piece of paper something good from that day. The goal was to open the jar at the end of the year and reflect on all of the good. Sadly, she never made it to the end of the year to reflect on those good memories. To prepare for today, I finally opened the jar and read through what she had written. Although painful, to see your handwriting on each of these notes and to recall the memories, I did so with the hope to help you understand how truly simple things brought joy. A few of the 2013 memories in the jar. On August 28th, making progress setting up the classroom. September 22nd, Laura's hockey game and hot pink cake. September 26th, successful open house at school. October 5th, out to dinner with mom and dad. October 19th, pizza, drinks, and Red Sox game with Jen and Mary. We're going to the World Series. Four days later, on the evening of October 23rd, the Boston Red Sox and more than 38,000 fans paused prior to the start of Game 1, the World Series at Fenway Park, to honor Colleen with a moment of silence. October 21st, her last memory, chocolate cream pie. Colleen had a smile that lit up her room an infectious laugh that would instantly make others smile. One of the best adjectives to describe Colleen, both as a child and as an adult, is excitable. It is one of the things I miss the most about her. The littlest of things would bring excitement to her face. It would put that bright smile on her face, a glow of pure joy and happiness. In most conversations with Colleen, that ever-present excitement in her voice would be present, even when describing, describing something as simple is how her school day had gone. You, Your Honor, saw that smile and excitement in the video that was played here in the court during the trial of her and Sarah in the hallway outside her classroom that day after school. What you saw in those clips is exactly who Colleen was, happy. She would share her excitement through her use of yays. There was a yay for just about anything, her yay math, her yay proofs, yay babies, it didn't matter big or small. She was always more excited for Dan and Laura than they were for themselves. It is who she was. And then there was Christmas. Christmas music, ABC Family Countdown, watching Home Alone for the hundredth time, to Christmas morning. At 24, she had the excitement of a five-year-old when it came to Christmas. She had that excitement not just for herself, but more importantly for Colleen, for others too. As you have witnessed throughout this trial by the presence of so many, Colleen loved her family more than anything, and they her. Spending time together was one of her favorite things to do. She loved family gatherings. She would try to come up with reasons for all of our extended family to gather. Many of her cousins were like siblings to her. We come from a very large family, and everyone is very close. Colleen was central to that. She loved her friends from just spending time with them doing simple things. She loved her life, and she embraced everyone in it. Her intense love of family was also reflected in her chosen career, one that she aspired to since preschool, where she had Miss Laura as her teacher. Colleen loved teaching. She had no doubt about the profession she had chosen. She loved planning her lessons and loved her students. She had established a set daily routine that she rarely wavered from. Tuesday, October 22nd, started just like all her other school days, 
Colleen popped into our bedroom at 6.15 to say goodbye. That would be the last time we heard her voice. And I struggled because I can't remember if I said goodbye. That was the day evil crossed her path. I will ever never understand how such evil could exist in this world, or more importantly, how such evil could cross Colleen's path, a path of unwavering love, caring, and kindness. As I previously testified, when Colleen didn't arrive home as she ordinarily did, I tried calling and texting her. I still have my final text to her, saying, where are you? If you are driving, don't answer. She never answered. The events of that afternoon and early that evening I've already testified to. When receiving the phone call from Todd, Tom, myself, and Laura, who was only 17 at the time, headed to Danvers High School, having no idea what we were heading into. Had I known that something so horrific could have happened, I never would have brought Laura with us. As instructed, we left the school to go to the Danvers Police Station. We sat at the police station for many hours. After a short time, I called Dan who was away at school to let him know that Colleen was missing, but to stay there and I would call him when I knew something. At one, her at one point, we heard that the missing student was found. I thought things were going to be okay, that something must have happened, but if the student was found, that Colleen would be found. But again, we waited for, our, for, for hours for any news. Take your time, please. And then we saw several police officers walking towards us, and I knew it was bad. They called us into a room, and with Laura, at 17, by our side. We were not told that Colleen had been found, but that they had found Colleen's body in the woods behind Dara's High School. I only asked two questions. How? And they told me with a box cutter. And who? Was it the student? And they said yes. I then had to call Dan at school and tell him that Colleen was dead. I told him to get a friend and to come home. I wish I had done things differently that day. I wish I had called sooner. That I had left Laura at home when we went to the school and that I had not told Dan over the phone. I wish I could have helped Colleen, but no one could have helped her that day because no one knew what evil sat in her classroom that day. That moment in time has forever changed my family and my family's lives. Our lives will never be the same. We will never feel the happiness we did before that horrific day. And the gaping hole in our lives will never be filled. We will never get a second chance to be with Colleen. The absence of Colleen from our lives grows stronger with each day and with each family occasion. Her bedroom, her place at the dinner table, and her spot on the couch where she prepared her lessons sits empty day after day. Dan and Laura lost their big sister that day, their first friend, mentor, and first teacher. Other than a teacher, the only thing as a child Colleen wanted more was to be a big sister. She loved that role more than anything. I miss hearing the banter between them. Colleen had totally different relationships with Dan versus Laura. Colleen spent many hours caring for Dan and Laura after school. Dan loved to pick on Colleen because she was an easy target for him, and Colleen would just laugh. She would try to give Dan advice, which sometimes he didn't want to take, although he knew she was right. Dan left for college in August, and that was the last time he saw his big sister. He left for college only to return to a house with an empty room. As a little boy, Dan would sneak into Colleen's room and sleep on the floor next to her bed. No matter how many times we put him back in his room, we would always find him the next morning in Colleen's room. Now, every day, he walks by Colleen's room, an empty room. Dan's last two years of college are a blur to me, and I feel like I missed out on being there for him. He turned 21 less than a month after that horrific day, and Colleen was not there to celebrate that milestone and have a drink with him. Dan graduated from college this past May without Colleen there to cheer her mom. She would have been so proud of what he has accomplished under such difficult circumstances, as are Tom and I, and she would have been so excited for him. Colleen will not be there for Dan's wedding, never be an aunt to his children. They will never be able to have the relationship that adult siblings have. Laura lost her only sister that day. October 2013 was the beginning of her senior year of high school, which should have been one of the best years of her life. Instead, it was one of the most horrific times of her life. 
She heard things no teenage girl should have had to hear. Her life and decisions she needed to make regarding her future were severely altered that October day. It was time when she was applying to colleges and trying to make a decision on where she wanted to go. The effects of that day significantly impacted that choice of where to go to college. Distance from our home was now an important factor because we knew that the trial would take place while she was attending college. Her safety at college became a major factor in the decision. Colleen had been so excited for her as she looked at school. Colleen, as much as she loved having Dan as a brother, loved having a sister. From the day Laura was born, there was a close bond that only can be found in sisters. Colleen was the second mother to Laura. They spent so much time together growing up. Colleen would, would take Laura to hockey, would cheer, cheer for her from the stand, she would help teach Laura to drive, and she would take her prom dress shopping. All the things big sisters do. Laura will not have her big sister there to be her maid of honor on the day she marries, and her children will not have an aunt. As Laura mentioned earlier, on January 20th, 2014, Laura skated onto the ice as co-captain of the Andover High Girls Hockey varsity team, all wearing pink jerseys to honor Colleen to play the Danvers girls. I could only think of how excited Colleen would have been to attend because she would have decide, had to decide whether to cheer for her baby sister, as she always did, or cheer for her students from Danvers High. Instead, Laura took the ice, not with Colleen in the stands, but to observe a moment of silence in her memory of her beloved older sister. Laura graduated from high school in June of 2014 without Colleen there and started college without her there to share in the excitement. Colleen was Laura's biggest cheerleader in life. Laura has had to endure the many legal battles and the lengthy trial through the first year and a half of her college life. Again, years that should be the best times of her life. Colleen would be so proud, as are Tom and I, of what Laura has achieved under such diff difficult circumstances these past 28 months. But on that October day, Dan and Laura not only lost their sister, the sister they loved, they lost their parents, especially the mother that they knew, the person that I was, the person that I will never be again. Instead, they now have a mother who is so very broken. Dan and Laura now parent Tom and I as they try so hard to help get us through each day to try to put smiles on our faces. For 24 years, I had Colleen by my side to love and to be loved by her. And for 17 years, I had three children in my home. These are my three children. This picture represents so much to me. First, this is the picture of Colleen in the pink shirt that will be recognized by many as the picture that flashed across TV that day and many days since. We were under tremendous pressure from the media that day as they waited outside our home to provide a photo of Colleen. This picture was taken in June 2013 at Colleen's cousin's graduation party. It was one of the most recent pictures that we had of Colleen, and she had that incredible smile on her face. We cropped this picture to give to the media so they would leave us alone to mourn in private. But what this picture more importantly represents to me is the last picture I have of my three children together. This was the last family occasion that we were at with all three kids and knew it was an ideal time to take our annual picture of the three kids to be used for our Christmas card. One of the most difficult things to do now is to take a picture of my children. I love Dan and Laura with all that I have, but to take a picture of the two of them together brings so much pain because Colleen's absence from the picture is overwhelming. There are supposed to be three children in the picture. There was always supposed to be three, and there will never be three again. Life will never have the same joy and happiness that it once did for me. There will always be the empty seat. Time only makes our absence more noticeable. Time does not lessen the pain, it strengthens it. Too many family times when Colleen should be there, and her absence so strong. Colleen loved do doing things together, and she always loved just being home, so we spent a lot of time together. Colleen was the age where I could be her friend and not just her mother. I will never have that opportunity now. She was ready for the next chapter in her life since she was happy with her career. 
She was going to school to pursue her master's and making plans to move out with her friends. She was at the point where she was ready for her personal life to be her priority. She wanted to meet someone, to marry, and have children. I will never see Colleen in a wedding dress. I will never see her walk down the church aisle that we would often talk about before or after Mass. And I will never see her be a mother, the thing she wanted most to be. Tom and I will never be a grandmother and grandfather to Colleen's children. I know her kids would have had an amazing smile in her loving kindness. Colleen loved babies, loved kids, and Colleen would have made an amazing mother. Evil took all that away from Colleen and from me, Tom, Dan, and Laura. Every holiday, especially Christmas, is so very difficult. Colleen's birthday, the anniversary of that horrible day, and the 22nd of every month is filled with such pain. And weekends are so very difficult because the house is so empty without her. Sundays especially because Sunday afternoon was our family time. We never got the opportunity to see Colleen teach or to see her classroom. I finally saw her classroom that day in court when the pictures were put up on the screen. I saw two things when I saw that picture. Her Assumption College banner hanging on the wall and her blue coat hanging on the back of her chair because he had forgotten to steal that. Colleen and our family did everything right. We loved each other, we took care of each other, we worked hard, and we followed the rules. We raised our children to be good, kind, and loving people, and in a matter of minutes, that evil took it all away. Colleen did nothing wrong other than to try and help him, and he devastated our lives by taking her life away. The loss of Colleen has taken a physical and an emotional toll on me. And during this legal process and sitting through court appearances, reliving that horrific day and learning the details of that day, seeing the physical evidence from that day, have taken a tremendous toll on me and my family. We've endured all this in the public eye. I have difficulty sleeping because I can't stop thinking about that day and the fear and the pain that Colleen suffered. But the emotional toll has been the worst. I do not like the person that I have become. I used to see the glass half full. I, like Colleen, was happy. And now I am lucky to have a day where I get as high as feeling empty. Now I isolate myself from the people I love because pretending to be happy is so very difficult. Putting the snake, fake smile on my face and telling people I'm okay is draining. Remaining composed in court during the many hearings and lengthy trial in order to be respectful of this court was physically and emotionally draining. I have tremendous anger and I am afraid for my children's lives in a way I never was before. Just getting through each day is a struggle. I have difficulty focusing on anything as my mind continually wanders to that horrible day, especially after learning all the horrific, brutal details in court. I struggle with my faith because I cannot believe that Colleen is okay, because how could she be okay after such brutal crimes? Every day there is something new that triggers the grief and anger, whether it be a certain date, a song, a picture, another legal battle, it can be anything. When we celebrate Dan and Laura or any of our family members, Colleen is always missing and therefore can never have true happiness again. Our family is incredibly grateful for the continued outpouring of support and meaningful, meaningful tributes to honor Colleen. The Sea of Pink which was often a topic during this trial, brings us moments of great comfort while at the same time brings great pain because it represents Colleen's absence. It always comes back to the bad, the evil that has sat before you without demonstrating any sense of remorse throughout the trial. On the news and in the newspapers, even when the stories about Colleen's continued influence on those she knew and never met, she is still always described as the slain or murdered Danvers teacher. That is not how she should be described or remembered, and to see that is extremely painful. Your Honor, this is not just one crime, but three crimes. There is no doubt that it was premeditated and planned. Colleen packed her school bag that day, just like she did every other day, with her books and her purple lunch bag, while he packed his bag, ready to take a life. Please allow me to explain the pain of each crime by sharing how we learned the details of that day. All we knew that night was that Colleen had been killed and that the weapon was a box cutter. We knew no other details as we went home to plan our 24-year-old daughter's funeral. Thank you. It wasn't until several days after Colleen's funeral, 
on October 31st, 2013, that we met with Ms. McDougall and her team, along with several of the police officers that had been there that night. Much of that meeting remains a blur, as I was still in shock. It was that day that we learned how Colleen had been killed, how her body had been found, that she had been sexually assaulted in the woods, and that she had been robbed that her credit cards had been stolen and that he'd used them to buy himself food and to go to a movie. We were told that he would be charged as an adult and that upon conviction, he would be given life in prison without the possibility of parole. We left and we went home with the difficult task of explaining to Dan and Laura the horrific details because we wanted them to learn them from us rather than the news. It was in January, 2014 when we were asked to meet Again, with Ms. McDougall and Ms. Leo, we met at the Lawrence Courthouse. I walked in the room. When I walked in that room, I knew what they were going to tell us. I asked the question before they had a chance to tell us that Colleen had been raped in the bathroom. As a mother, one of your worst fears for your daughter is that she could be sexually assaulted. He would now, in addition to the original three charges, be charged with sexually assaulting Colleen in the bathroom. This charge added to the horror of the crimes. We once again had to go home as Tom talked to Dan and I told my 17-year-old daughter that her sister had been raped as I saw such pain and fear in her eyes. The emotional and physical pain was intensified when we received a phone call on Christmas Eve of 2013 following the Supreme Judicial Court's ruling to change sentencing for juveniles convicted of first-degree murder by ruling that they could no longer be given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. It was devastating to hear that news knowing that the legal battle would never end for our family. Instead of following the federal court's appropriate and respectful decision to extend discretion to the judges, Massachusetts took that law one step too far and took away your right to sentence him to life without parole. Because of that immoral and unjust ruling, our family will be forced to publicly go through this pain again as we have to fight to keep such evil person in prison where he belongs for life. As Tom and I age, that burden will fall to Dan and Laura a burden that they should not carry. As we have sat through this very long trial and this very long judicial process, the horrific details of that day have been made known to all. You have heard and seen all the evidence, including statements he made that night to the police that clearly demonstrates that he knew exactly what he was doing and that he had a well thought out plan. You also know that there were four very specific crimes that day, even if he was only convicted of three. As Colleen's family, we believe those crimes must be f punished, separate and distinct from each other. Today, you have the responsibility to determine a right and just sentence. This case, your decision, will set a precedent for future cases. As Colleen's mom, her voice in this room, I urge you to impose the maximum sentence allowed to you under the restrictive SJC ruling. These sentences must be consecutive. They cannot be concurrent, as these crimes are separate and distinct, and the impact that each has had on our family is truly indescribable. You must remember that after he committed these brutal crimes, he calmly left and got himself dinner and went to a movie. You watched him calmly walk around the school on the video from DHS. There are two very important elements to that video from the school that I ask you to consider when determining the sentence for these crimes. The first is the video of Colleen talking to Sarah outside her classroom. Colleen wore her emotions on her sleeve. If anything had happened in that classroom between Colleen and him that would have caused her to be upset, or if she had thought she had upset him, you would have seen it on her face, and she would have told Sarah. Instead, you saw the Colleen that we all knew and loved, with the smile on her face and the excitement in her actions. The video of her walking to the girls' room clearly showed Colleen calm and happy with no concerns at all. Second, and most important, is that throughout this trial, he would often be described as staring into space. However, you watched him, as did I, how intently he paid attention to himself on that video. He did not shy away from watching it. He watched every clip of it with great attention and absolutely no remorse. When that video was broadcast, he was the most alive in this courtroom, including during Ms. McDougall's closing. He never once flinched or showed any sign of remorse or guilt. He deserves the sentence of death for the brutal crimes he committed, but that is not an option. 
he deserves life in prison without the eligibility of parole, but that is not an option. You do, though, have the option to set consecutive life sentences with parole eligibility at the highest level that the court allows for each of these crimes. Please begin the long and painful process of righting the wrong of the SJC and legislatures. You have the responsibility for Colleen, for our family, and for the community to put him away for the rest of his life. Even after 50 years, he could still have a life, a family, children, which cannot happen. He is pure evil, and evil can never be rehabilitated. You need to consider the safety of our family and the rest of the community as we live in fear if he ever gets out of prison. Colleen and our family will never get a second chance, and neither should he. I will never forgive him for what he did to Colleen and for what he took away from our family. Today, you need to make the right, just, and brave decision to give him three consecutive sentences with the maximum number of years before parole eligibility for each crime. As I shared in the beginning, today we return our focus to Colleen. Colleen is often remembered for her inspirational quotes that she posted on social media, quotes by which she lived her life. They weren't just words on paper to her, they were pieces of who she was as a person. Her legacy is based on two of these quotes. On August 11th, 2013, Colleen shared on social media, no matter what happens in life, be good to people. Being good to people is a wonderful legacy to leave behind. And on October 5th, 2013, she shared, Every day may not be good, but there is something good in every day. This is the person that Colleen was and continues to be. And although I struggle that my 24-year-old daughter has a legacy, I am honored at what that legacy is and proud to be her mother. Today, the good must prevail over the evil. You need to remember that Colleen matters. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you who Colleen is and the impact her loss has had and continues to have on my family. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.